So I think uh, we're on time here to go ahead and get started. Great. Well, thank you, Sean. Uh, and thank you from the Apache Conference for having us and for listening in on this session. We call attention to the presentations that have taken place on CTAKES, even the one just before that are and, and looking forward to continued development on this, this wonderful, wonderful piece of software. Uh, but continuing into this presentation, and I'll be joined by Jeffrey Miller, and we both work for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and today we're going to be discussing fault-tolerant, distributed, and scalable natural language processing, CTAKES. So the general objectives of this presentation will hopefully be able to give you uh, an understanding of the common challenges associated with extracting information from clinical narratives, and you might have already you might already be familiar with it or have seen it from previous presentations. Also, to describe the benefit of utilizing distributed computing frameworks to obtain structured data from natural language text, which is often what is stored in the EHRs, which we'll get to, and also to identify strategies for processing clinical narrative data in an ongoing matter. You know, it's great to have it in batch cycles, but we'd love to have this continued uh, on a daily basis, which is, I believe, something we saw in a previous presentation. Here's a general overview of the presentation. I will be giving a background about kind of where we are, how we got there, framework evaluations related to distributed computing, go over the results of our processing pipeline, and then Jeff Miller will be able to step in and talk about customizations of that pipeline, lessons learned, discussion, and we should have enough time for questions at the end. So give you a brief, brief background about computers in, in healthcare, and I, and I promise I will keep it brief since I believe many of you are likely pretty familiar with 2009, the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act was passed, also known as HITECH, and that really incentivized the use of electronic health records, which I'll further refer to as EHRs. And as a result of this, information from clinical visits and information from other aspects of clinical care began to be stored within the EHR. And that was great. You know, a lot, some of it was structured, but the way that physicians communicated between other physicians was still often through the clinical note, and it was also required for, for legal purposes. And so most of the information that was used and that had a lot of clinical relevance was still stored as unstructured free text. And that unstructured free text not only had the potential to enhance systems for patient care, such as clinical disk support or a number of other applications you uh, had seen at this, this conference, secondary research. And so the next step along this process is development of natural language processing. And commercial enterprises have developed natural language processing systems. It's not new. You know, um, Google has their own, Amazon has their own, as well as a number of other private companies. Unfortunately, a lot of those companies at least earlier in their, their days, really just focused on natural language text in general. And we're not necessarily focused on clinical text. And for which is a pediatric institution, even those that did apply you know, their natural language processing algorithms towards clinical text, it was very infrequently focused on, on pediatric. Um, and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem that we're, we're gonna continue to face, I think, uh, but we're, we're continuing to work on it. And, and Apache clinical text, or CTAKES, kind of was developed to fill that gap in that clinical knowledge base as it relates to natural language processing. And now, as many of you know, CTAKES runs as a single-threaded process. Um, but unfortunately, analyzing large sets of notes as a result of that single-threaded process can take months or even years to complete. You know, there are a number of different ways, as you've seen in previous presentations, of kind of spawning off. And that's really what we're going to talk to you about today, is how we were able to scale out this application across a wide number of and so the objective of our project was to utilize existing distributed computing frameworks. We wanted to try to, to build as little as possible to develop a fault tolerant and scalable CTAKES pipeline that was capable of processing millions of notes in parallel. And again, as promised, a brief overview of uh, distributed computing and kind of the evaluation of the frameworks will follow. And so distributed computing, components of a system shared amongst multiple machines to improve performance and that follows along that map reduced paradigm. The great thing about a lot of distributed computing frameworks today is that they are fault tolerant, so you don't necessarily have to be as concerned about that as you would perhaps in previous years. And a lot of the advanced frameworks um, support that, such as Apache, as well as Apache Beam. 
And for those that you are not familiar with that traditional MapReduce paradigm, this is a very high level conceptual overview of it. On the left side here, you will see that text, this is kind of the clinical narrative, text is being input into uh, the system, the, the computing frame, which will then be split among a number of different machines. It takes aspects of it. Um, and then at which point all of those notes that have been split across all of those machines or worker nodes and uh, executors, if you're talking in Spark language, will then be reduced in method. The C takes in this instance, which will then spit out final results of a number of different entities um, or discrete data and that can be stored in a database and hopefully used for further research or again to translate back into the bedside care. And so as far as operational tooling goes of the of the process of the pipeline itself, you know, we did evaluate frameworks and uh, we developed pipelines for both Beam and Spark. Um, excuse me. Getting pop-ups here. Sorry, this is frustrating. Okay, there we go. We did evaluate UMAAS, um, but we were really looking for something that was really managed. Again, we wanted to try to use the existing technology as much as possible, and so we uh, ultimately provided the tools for both Spark and and Beam was really nice in that it provided a lot of built-in support for the notion of side inputs. And as Jeff will mention a little bit later in the presentation, kind of had the, the option for free to develop a DAG and, and work, work from that. Which, um, the one unfortunate aspect of Beam in the environment that we used it in, which is not necessarily a limitation of Beam across the board, was that we didn't have as much control over the execution environment. And this is kind of tying back into that single threaded issue related to CTAKES. Um, we really needed to make sure that any CTAKES process that we were running when operating on, on a Windows CPU, we didn't have any threading issues which would cause um, unfortunate circumstances. And so the results of our pipeline, I just jumped straight into it, uh, was a pipeline that processed 84,387,661 notes, and it only took 89 minutes. It provided over 170 million ontology Mappings, and we really first focused on the human phenotype ontology, and that was the base of our dictionary. We took out ARCs, norm, we took out snow, but we really, really just focused on uh, HPO, and that certainly has considerations for uh, performance, as you'll likely uh, be aware of. Um, the cluster itself scaled to 240 worker machines, 64 cores, uh, with 240 gigabytes of RAM. The process run on C takes kind of out of the box on a single machine. It's estimated would have taken about 396 days. And I'll show you where I got these very, very rough estimates. Um, and this is that that slide. So here you have standard C takes at the top, looking at document count, you know, about 3,000 notes. It took about 22 minutes. 6,000 notes here it took about 42 minutes. Again, this was probably run on my local machine. Very cheap, just takes a while. Then you have Apache Beam, which we did also evaluate. I'll Top to the bottom of it first. And the first iteration we did, a little over 2 million notes. Uh, the Beam runner that was supported kind of automatically scaled. It scaled up to 418 machines. And the first iteration of this, we used four cores. Uh, hopefully, that, you know, think, you know, we'll just be able to run it in. It'll be able to kind of identify how much, uh, how much processing it needs and be able to limit that CPU uh, for the, the threading issue. Unfortunately, we found out that the execution environment didn't necessarily allow that, so we then traded down to a smaller number of cores, one to kind of handle the process and the other to handle the actual, um, just kind of the machine over overarching architecture. Uh, it took about 44 minutes to get on 2 million notes. And then here you have the Spark, 900,000 notes, 8 minutes, 1.7 million notes, 30 minutes, and then 84 million notes, 245 machines, 64 cores, 89 minutes, and this I think roughly equates to about 15,500 executors. Um, and the great thing about this was that it was actually pretty cheap. Um, you know, it's all relative, 1,300 not, not a lot of money, but uh, given the how much you would likely spend it elsewhere, it, it's uh, a pretty pretty affordable, I think. I also wanted to give you an overview of the actual documents themselves. Like I said we processed about 84 million notes. 
Uh, each of those notes could have multiple versions depending on whether or not and it updated it or indented the note at a later time. So each note had about 1.3 versions. The length of this note was about 1,600 characters, obviously a pretty wide standard deviation there. It was the, the note population of the, the, the corpus itself was represented by over 18,000 individual providers, 115 provider types like attending physician, nurse, nurse practitioner, uh, physical therapist, things like that, and representing over 92 clinical services such as pulmonary or allergy. The characteristics of the actual analysis, what we got on the, on the other side was about 707 million annotations. Um, and just for context, the HPO dictionary size, like I said, it's much smaller than SNOMED and RxNorm. It's about 14,800 distinct uh, items or entities within the dictionary. And the process itself picked up 7,500 unique terms as a part of the analysis. And at this point, I'd love to give it over to, to Jeff to, to finish up the presentation. And just, just FYI, Jeff, I, I cannot see you on my screen. So if you just want to give me a shout when you need to swatch, uh, switch the slides. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Jeff Miller, and I, I work with Jarrett. Um, so uh, one of the, the secondary goals of our work or actually one of the primary goals of this work, is to enable researchers to run uh, two takes on cohorts of notes um, that, that, that may be you know, part of a particular project they're working on. Uh, the work that Jarrett uh, showed before was sort of a larger project, um, a larger project meant to run, run on all or a, a majority of notes uh, generated each day. And so um, what I'm going to talk about is how we uh, further customized this deployment to support setting different options um, for the pipeline to be run on to be run on more of a one-time um, analysis, um, more of a one-time analysis uh, for a given quarter nodes. And these are all sort of customizations to the default pipeline. Uh, can you go next slide, Jared. So, um, one basically, th these are a list of settings that when we when we actually started talking with researchers at the institute that needed to do, to use C takes, these are the different types of settings that it seemed like um, were going to be convenient for them to be able to to set for for, for a given project. And that includes the C takes dictionary. Um, also, adding in uh, a bar separated value file containing additional, perhaps custom terms that are not part of the UMLS, that are part of any sort of generated dictionary. Um, one of the big customization points is, is negation detection. We actually have three separate configurations of various um, negation engines that we support right now, depending on what the research wants to do. So we have sort of a default ML one. Um, and we have then the neg, neg, the neg X option and a sort of combination of them both. But we wanted we wanted users to be able to um, bring a set of uh, patterns for negation if if that if they if that was required. We found that um, for particular projects, the built-in machine learning um, negation detection was missing some scenario that the researchers were interested in. We also allow a given project to determine whether or not they want to use an overlap JCAST term annotator or the um, the standard default JCAST term annotator, and that's basically whether or not you want to um, you want to allow for discontinuous spans in your in your uh, resulting annotations. And because we are running this project and we're not we're not storing the entire XMI output that C takes might create. We have an option of whether or not you want to store all of the entity mentions that are found in a given um, run of C takes, or only more specific ones. So entity mentions is like one of is like the base, um, most generic met span that C takes might find. But you know, we generally would only keep this, things like disease disorder mentions, lab mentions, that kind of thing. Um, but some projects may want may need to add in that more general setting. Uh, and another setting that's important, and I'll talk a little bit more later about why, is the uh, number of notes that are allowed, that are sent to each Spark executor. Uh, we go to the next slide, please. 
So just some details about this. Uh, the, these settings are determined from, uh, can be set via a Jenkins parameterized job. So it's a number of drop downs and fill ins that, that um, either the researcher or someone on research behalf can, can set. Um, and this initiates um, a serverless Python function that then kicks off the job. And, and the things that that function does are effectively looking at all the settings that the, that the person configured and writing a Piper file to, to uh, accomplish that, as well as staging dictionary files and that kind of thing in shared storage, where they'd be accessible um, to, this, to the cluster. Um, and one of the things that we're uh, actually migrating to right now is currently our architecture uses a message bus between stages in, in the um, in in this pipeline to initiate um, to initiate the next step. And we're moving to more of a workflow, da a DAG, um, you know, directed a cyclic graph type of architecture, um, so that we can programmatically set a, a, a linear set of steps and um, have it sort of run and visualize it as it's happening. Um, this just is much easier to debug uh, from, from our perspective than a, a more distributed um, message bus driven algorithm. Um, so um, some of the lessons learned from this, um, and if you just give me one second here, some of the lessons that we learned from this was that it's important to have a failure mechanism for long running documents. Um, we found that depending on um, C, depending on C takes um, setup, the version. I know there are some there are probably some fixes on, on, on trunk for this, but um, you know by default the default clinical pipeline can get hung up on longer documents, and um, you don't want that to bring down the entire job. And so we 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 have a procedure for uh, if a, if a node is taking too long, uh, stopping it and just annotate just sending setting um, recording that that there was a failure for sort of manual review later on. Um, all nodes are not the same. Uh, so what, is, what we're trying to say here is that um, the, a cluster and sort of architecture for a given uh, Spark cluster that works for all nodes in this institution may not actually work that well for a smaller subset of nodes if those nodes are, for example, longer. And the reason this came up um, through running a, a set of notes on a more complex cohort where the notes tended to be longer. And so the number of the number of notes sent to each executor um, had to be brought down for the Spark cluster to run successfully or to run within a reasonable amount of time because those notes were longer. Whereas if they were, even if the same notes were included in a larger cohort, distributed, they would have been distributed across um, a larger cluster and they wouldn't have been focused on individual nodes or in, in, in individual executors. Uh, and so they it would have it would have less an effect on the cluster overall. So um, that's one of the reasons we had to make that that setting available to change given given each job. Uh, and so that's something you have to think about when you're when you're running um, uh, CTEX uh, in Spark on a number of on, on different types of jobs. Um, we also were sort of looking at the max Spark cluster size, and we and we sort of learned that this is application specific. Um, and, and Jared has referred to the fact that um, CTAKES is single threaded and that, you know, there are ways um, and annotators that are, that allow for um, potential use of multiple threads within a single process. But one of the, um, one of the things we were trying to do is run CTAKES as close to out of the box as we could for researchers um, and with a specific version of CTAKES. And so we were trying to use the code almost as is. And with that, there are restrictions, uh, the, the process restrictions. And because of that, uh, we had a sort of unusual Spark cluster in that our, our, um, the, 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 the executors were all basically given their own uh, CPU on each node, which is not normally the way a, um, a Spark cluster is put together. Usually, you know, you can have multiple executors on a single CPU. And as a result, um, we were running into a bit of a bottleneck, um, whereas we couldn't have quite as large a cluster as we were expecting because the orchestration node had to do, it seemed like the orchestration node had to do much more um, talking back and forth because it had so many more executors than would typically be necessary. So while I believe the, um, the, the Spark frequently asked questions talks about a large cluster being 8,000 nodes we actually ran into, um, you know, a, 
a, a much small, we ran into problems at a much smaller uh, level size cluster, but it had many executors. And also, as I kind of mentioned, um, using a workflow engine that allows you to, to, to sort of to, to draw out your, uh, your, your pipeline is, is very helpful because it, um, it makes debugging easier uh, rather than, again, a more of a distributed um, workflow. Can we go to the next slide? So future directions, I mean, our, our main goal here, as I put in the last bullet, is to, is to make using CTAKES um, uh, for, for researchers, potentially non-technical uh, people, as easy as possible. And so um, we're looking at additional customizations that users may want for a particular run. And so some of the things we're looking at are being able to change the min character span that an entity that an entity can be the default is three, but in some runs, depending on what you're looking for, you may want to go lower, like two, depending on if you're looking for abbreviations or something. Um, we're also looking at uh, um, changing the ability to, to to set the exclusion tags parameter for the um, JCAS annotator, so that you could determine you, you could determine for each run whether or not you wanted. Um, certain parts of speech to be able to contain entity mentions. And um, I saw in a presentation from Sean uh, earlier this week that there is that that setting um, is sort of being simplified a little bit in the future. And so it might, you might be interested to go back and look at that presentation because I'm sure that that would be uh, helpful. Um, we also might look, be looking into adding some custom trained annotation engines um, as we sort of explore the idea of, of creating um, machine learning models here on our data. Um, limitations, you know, C we, we have run into some some issues with CTX on high density nodes, and I, again, I think there are some um, some bug fixes on trunk for that. But um, there were we weren't able we're not able to process all nodes. It's actually a very small number of nodes that run into a problem, but that was a limitation. Um, this does require substantial resources. Um, you know, there's a fairly large cluster that we turned up and turned down. Um, and again, as you know, caveat here, this is all based on a single pediatric institution where we did this work. Uh, Jared, if you could use the next slide. So, in conclusion, you know, we were we were able to um, use CTAKES to deploy. I'm sorry, use Spark to deploy CTAKES um, basically as is without without really changing any of the underlying CTAKES code. Um, and we've we found that it's important to be able to to tweak settings in the uh, default pipeline um, depending on the needs of given researchers, and, and that's been really important and, and, and the focus of some of the work that I just discussed. Um, and it's also helped us sort of efficiently iterate. Um, it's also important for us to be efficiently iterate on different pipelines uh, within within our research at our institution. Finally, just a couple of acknowledgments here. Evanette Burroughs and Bill Flynn from our team were very helpful um, in helping us to architect this solution. And we'd also just like to take, thank the CTAX community um, that is always very, very helpful in message boards and we probably would not have been able to get this done without them. Um, and um, I think with that, I just also want to thank everyone for uh, their, their time today and, and attending this, uh, this session. Thank you. That was very good. There are a series of questions in the chat box. I don't know if you are reading them and just want to take them yourself or if you want me to uh, run through them for you. Yeah, I, can, I can read them. Um, so I, the first question, I'm not, we, we didn't split up nodes across, no, across nodes. So I'm not sure exactly, uh, Peter, what you're, I'm not exactly sure I understand that question, but if you could, if you wanted to clarify it, maybe we could answer that one. Um, uh, Dr. Savova, yes, we could um, definitely share uh, slides from the presentation. Um, so we work with a number of, um, another question about PHI requirements on the cluster. We work with a number of cloud providers, uh, but we have um, the necessary uh, BAs in place to, to, to use them. Um, other questions. This is about CTAKES in generally. Um, has it been updated recently? So CTAKES 4.00, the last sort of tagged version has been, um, it is, you know, from 2017. The code on the, the trunk and subversion is consistently updated, 
Um, and you kind of have to watch it to see new developments. Although um, from Sean's earlier presentations this week, you could get a, 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 um, a, a preview of some very cool developments. Um, and, I, and I'm not exactly sure, but I believe, I believe Sean, if you could answer this, I, I, I think there may be another version, at least in early stages of, of release. Um, but you, you can you know, compile the code from the, from the trunk at any time. Um, we, we tend to use 4.00 because we're working in research and we actually want uh, researchers to be able to cite something specific that they used. Um, and so we, we sort of have stuck with that uh, purposefully. Um, that answers that question. Um, yes, yeah, so happy to chat afterwards uh, about this. Hey Jeff, this is this is Jared. I just wanted to jump in for for Peter's question in terms of uh, splitting across uh, additional nodes. So that was that was, I guess, a, a poor a poor diagram. Uh, in terms of its representation, those are all supposed to be single nodes that did get split. I mean, so like an entire node is going to be processed by one one C takes engine. So we're not necessarily splitting the notes up, though. That has been something we've been doing in a hopefully responsible way for those notes that do take substantially longer to process. So we'll sit and try to process for you know hours at a time, you know, overnight. And so trying to find if there is a marker where we could split on, you know, multiple carriage returns or something like that. So then you may not have the, the reference problems that, that you're, you're, you're speaking of. Um, hope that answers your question. Are there other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Getting that right. Peter's suggesting by section, maybe a yeah, section or, you know, potentially sentence, um, but yeah. Are there any other questions? And we're also, we're also hoping to contribute back to the, the CTAKES community, the, you know, the code that we, we've written for this. It's just a matter of uh, taking some time to, to clean it up a bit to remove any chop related information, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Yes, there's a question. How often do we run these extractions? So our initial um, our initial plan was to run it nightly. Uh, we were going to do one large job to catch up um, from the past and run it nightly. Um, and we actually haven't we haven't put that into practice in that we run every single night because what actually became more useful was more immediately useful for our work was researchers requesting the specific specific larger cohorts with specific requirements. And so we will run those, you know, on demand for users. And I, I think in the future, we will be doing a nightly extraction as we build up tools uh, within research, within, within, our, within our research environment for researchers to sort of help index notes. Um, but um, right now it's been more focused on the, the, uh, the individual cohorts. Um, um, and so we've, you know, we've run a number of those sort of one-off cohorts for researchers. The next question says, uh, do you see researchers using extracts in conjunction with the notes themselves or structured data? Um, we have both. We have, it, that happens both. It depends on the project, depends on, it depends on um, what the researcher is trying to do. I mean, usually they use it in conjunction with the notes. Um, I, I, think, I think the reality, in reality, you know, C takes, is good, but it is not 100% accurate. And so getting a sense, it's important for researchers to get a sense of, of how accurate um, things are. And often one of, the, one of the things we're looking at is, you know, how can we help improve accuracy custom, and customize the pipeline for us? So when researchers are looking at both, it is helpful. Um, uh, and also structured data, I mean, also the answer could be both. They might also use other structured data with the notes themselves. Um, so the question is, do you have customized pipelines by project? Uh, or how do you keep track of different pipelines? So the, um, we, the, way that the, the way that it works right now is we have a Jenkins job that, that you fill in the details of your, um, of your pipeline within, within reason. It has to be some of the settings that I mentioned. And then that Jenkins job results in the creation uh, automatically of a Piper file that meets those needs, and then runs the and then runs it. Uh, and the all these things are also recorded in shared storage, so the pipeline is saved somewhere, the dictionary is saved somewhere, um, 
and the results are saved somewhere. And so all that is sort of saved on the fly uh, for reference later on. Um, does that answer your question? So basically we keep track of code that then writes these different pipelines. Um, and again, it's sort of starting from the default clinical pipeline and you're kind of diffing off of it by answering those questions. That is something we are actively working on right now. Um, this is part of a larger project at our institution to uh, enable research. And we are, we are looking at, um, you know, providing visualizations um, to, to show how accurate they are. And we're also looking at actually just giving some measurements on how accurate C takes is by uh, running it on some notes for which we have uh, had annotators annotate. But as of right now, no, uh, we are actively working on that though. That, that question was, do you have a suite of visualization tools to go with output to measure the quad of extraction? Um, the question is, do you always use stripped down dictionaries? Um, um, do we always, the, this, this differs um, project by project. A researcher can specify what they're interested in. Um, they can bring their own dictionary too. Um, we chose H, the, when, when Jared's, the, the discussion that Jared was talking about, we used HBO because, um, because it is often used in research and genetics and from a standpoint of annotations most, most useful to a wide variety of researchers, it made a lot of sense. And frankly, it was sort of an easier, pro, an easier thing to accomplish on a large set of notes than a, a very large dictionary based on SNOMED. Um, so it does vary. Uh, we have run cohort jobs that do use not, that, that do use effectively a much larger dictionary though. Um, annotation tools, what are any favorites? Yes, we did a deep dive on that. Um, and we eventually arrived at the classic BRAT annotator because it just does it all. Um, a lot of other annotators have a, a more modern interface, um, more modern sort of um, uh, potentially more recently designed, but BRAT um, allows for a very nice uh, customization and allows very nice relations between annotations, which we're not necessarily using in CTX right now, but we plan on using for other projects. And so um, we have um, we have uh, RAT um, uh, implemented within our within our organization. No problem. Uh, I don't know. Was there a time check? At this? Certainly, I think we have a little bit more time. If there's any other questions, I'm happy to chat again afterwards um, or outside of this discussion. I'm not, I'm not sure how long we can hang out in this room, but um, I don't know if you have anything. I, I kind of, all the answers there, anything you wanted to add to any of those answers, please. No, that's great. I think I answered think them very thoroughly. It was perfect. Um, I, I think the slides for the presentation, I, I uploaded that yesterday, I believe, but I made some modifications. So I'll, I'll try to go back in and actually uh, upload a more more recent version. But if you do have, have any questions or, or would like to connect more directly, feel free to reach out to us uh, at any time. All right. Well, yeah, I think our time is up. Thank you both. That was really interesting. Uh, it was also neat to see the two of you uh, tag team off of each other like that. Um, and cover several items all in a very short amount of time. All right. Thanks, John. Right. Appreciate it. Thank thanks, John, for moderating. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.